Picture yourself as a photographer. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there? Your name is James Blaine Shackleford, and it's 1922. Your talents as a photographer has garnered you a spot in working with the one and only Roy Chapman Andrews, famous for his travels around the world and his studies and discoveries of various wildlife, both living and extinct. His most notable expeditions were when he traveled to the harsh deserts of Mongolia, specifically the Gobi Desert. In one of these series of expeditions taking place between 1922 and 1930, you are brought along as his higher cinematographer, but you yourself are a bit of an explorer, so this is just another adventure for you as well. Andrews hopes to find any remains of human ancestors in this region, but in this search, you find something much more extraordinary. As Andrews searches for human remains, you stumble upon the remains of a strange looking creature. It's hard to make out what exactly it could be, but it's small. It has four limbs, possibly quadrupedal, and it has an abnormal skull shape. What you didn't realize at the time was that you were the first to have discovered this creature, who will soon be known as the Protoceratops. Or were you? Before we cover that though, let's talk more about the Protoceratops. Protoceratops were sheep-sized ceratopsids that lived in what is now known as the Gobi Desert. Despite being early relatives of the much larger ceratopsids like Triceratops, Protoceratops was a much smaller addition to the family, and on top of that they lacked the horns that the much larger members of the family were known for having. It still had a large frill and a parrot-like beak, and it walked quadrupedally unlike its early ancestors like the Psittacosaurus that walked on their hind legs. But one of the more unique aspects of this creature is the fact that they were able to thrive in the desert environment since not only is it a very harsh environment in general, but it also seems like a place that would be uncommon for ceratopsids to live in. Regardless, the first of this species would be discovered in 1922. An expedition would be led by Rory Chapman Andrews to the Gobi Desert in search of remains for human ancestors. The crew's photographer, James Blaine Shackleford, would come across the remains of what would eventually become known as the Protoceratops. So at first glance, it would seem that this expedition would be marked as the first ever discovery of this dinosaur, right? Well, this is where the story takes a bit of a turn, as others may speculate otherwise. One person in particular being Adrian Mayer, who argued in her book titled The First Fossil Hunters that this dinosaur was originally discovered by a nomadic tribe of people who would use it as the inspiration for the creation of the legendary Griffin mythos. This idea actually originated from a paper that Mayer worked on with Michael Heaney in 1993 before she would continue it in her book. Now you all should be familiar with what the Griffin is, you know, the mythological creature that has the body of the lion to represent courage and strength and the head of an eagle, which is meant to represent victory and loyalty. I know I probably didn't need to explain this, but for the sake of context, it's here. Now I'm not at all an expert in mythology, and this research kind of made me want to bang my head against the wall, but I was determined. Or stupid, I don't know. Apparently, it's thought that griffins originated in the Levant in the second millennium BCE, but from what I can find, there doesn't seem to be a solid date as to when it first originated. I don't know if it's the sites that I'm looking at, or something else, but frankly, I don't care because a specific date is not all that relevant. At the time, it was used more as a decorative piece for people in the ancient Middle East and Mediterranean, but in terms of its spread throughout parts of Asia and Greece, it apparently began around the 14th century BCE. And it's thought that the descriptions of the griffin from Greek writers may have started around 675 BCE, which was also around the same time that Greeks first made contact with the Scythians. Who were the Scythians, you may be asking? Well, they are a nomadic tribe of people from Eurasia who traveled and made their way through the Gobi Desert in search of gold. This also happened to be the same area in which Protoceratops would eventually be discovered in, and all at the same time, a story would begin to surface, told by the same people, of the gold guarding griffins. Could it be possible that the Scythians could have scaled the region by the Altai mountains and come across the fossilized remains of a prehistoric animal, coming to the conclusion that rather being a prehistoric animal, it was a griffin that was brought here to guard the very gold that this nomadic group sought? Could it be possible that they decided to bring these remains with them to which they would continue their nomadic lifestyle and eventually end up making first contact with the Greeks to which they would then see these remains and come to the same conclusions? I suppose it could be plausible. Hey, quick pause from the video. I was recording these lines and I was wondering, is that really how you pronounce that word? Do you really pronounce it Scythians? So I decided to look it up and it turns out it's actually pronounced Scythians. So yeah, I don't know why I decided to look up how to pronounce that word right in the middle of my recording session for this video, but I will be pronouncing it correctly the rest of the video and uh, just do your best to ignore all of the times I mispronounced it in the beginning of the video. Anyways, bye.
The Greeks were known for making their own interpretations from fossilized remains, but they weren't known for actually discovering fossils. So if there was any way they would have learned about the legendary griffin aside from the spread of its belief that had apparently been going on since 14,000 BCE, it would have most likely been through their contact with the Scythians. This means that while James Blaine Shackleford was the first person in our modern world to discover the protoceratops, the actual first discovery could date back all the way before the common era. And this is nothing new. It's likely that people from the ancient world had to have stumbled upon pieces of the past well before we did. There's plenty of evidence of that, but of course that's not the argument here. While this further helps the plausibility of the Protoceratops being hailed as the very influence for at least the Greek interpretation of the griffin, is this enough to confirm this? Well, according to the American Museum of Natural History site, the arguments that Mare made were mainly made up of the overall anatomy of the Protoceratops, and how it compared to that of the griffin. Turns out they had many similarities, just like the griffin, the Protoceratops had a beak. It walked on all fours. <laughs> the little stumps on the skull resembling ears apparently, and of course, their elongated shoulder blades indicates the possibility of wings. If I'm going to be honest, a lot of these comparisons seem like a stretch, but maybe it's just the way I've interpreted it. But it seems that others have different ideas in regards to this belief because in 2016, paleontologist, paleo artist, and author Mark Paul Witten would counter this argument in a blog post, claiming that the idea that the protoceratops being the inspiration for the griffin mythos was not possible. And this is where things get a bit confusing for me because before I was under the impression that the argument that Mare was making was that the Protoceratops helped further the spread of the idea of the griffin. But this blog post makes it seem like the Protoceratops was the inspiration for the creation of the griffin as a whole. And I guess the way I've been wording this whole video, I've been making it seem like, yeah, that was the idea. But that's just based off the things that I've seen within the articles and the research that I've done for this video. Pretty much all of it has just been claiming that there's this hypothesis surrounding the idea that the Protoceratops was the inspiration for the creation creation of the griffin. At this point, I'm kind of lost. I could be very wrong here, so I apologize in advance if maybe I interpreted the research incorrectly. But going back to this blog post, to summarize, Witten goes through the history of the Protoceratops griffin theory, which is much more vast than I originally thought. What was once something I saw as an obscure piece of dinosaur history ended up being something that many paleontologists seem to have accepted as true. Except for Witten, who believed that the original speculations for this theory weren't specific enough and were made primarily for the sake of the lore behind the griffin. He also discusses the inconsistencies within the timeline of the griffin lore and goes through the anatomical differences between the dinosaur and the myth and talks about how they're more different than they're explained to be. In this argument, he pondered over the idea that if there was what he described as a solid real world basis for griffins, when the Greeks and Scythians made contact with each other, then why wouldn't the griffin look more like a protoceratops? Why did it keep its lion and eagle look? It's not like the skeletal remains of the protoceratops look that close to the skeletal remains of lions and birds, yet that's how the legend remained. Protoceratops may have had a beak, but unlike most depictions of the griffin, it wasn't completely toothless, as it had two rows of cheek teeth on each side. It may have been quadrupedal like a griffin, but it lacked the powerful limbs and sharp claws that griffins were also known for having, since they do have the body of a lion. There may have been some depictions of Protoceratops with feathers and or quails, but in most of these depictions, the feathers or quails are only covering its tail region. In most depictions of the griffins, they have a large portion of feathers covering their bodies. He also talks about the compared behaviors that both griffins and protoceratops seem to share, for example their parenting skills. But this piece of speculation has a bunch of holes in it as well, according to Winton, as he explains, there is no need to invoke a third party fossil species to explain the behavior in griffins when thousands of modern species could have provided the same inspiration. This trait is just not specific enough to implicate protoceratops as being referenced in griffin lore. Not to mention that there is no evidence whatsoever of ancient people discovering dinosaur eggs or nests. He even goes through the complications with the idea that the Scythians may have come across these skeletal remains during their search for gold. While there were multiple prehistoric species discovered around these gold deposits, Protoceratops specifically were not actually all that common around these sites or trade routes. Apparently, the nearest set of Protoceratops fossil remains were located several hundred kilometers east of these areas, and that's apparently with the same maps that Mare used in both her paper and her book. This would mean the nomads would have had to travel off route by 
by hundreds of kilometers to make the discovery of the Protoceratops, and that would also mean that area would need to contain gold, since that's the whole reason they were traveling through this region in the first place. Apparently, Mayer said in her paper that it was possible that gold could have been swept away from the main deposits during a storm and ended up near the same rock beds that Protoceratops would eventually be discovered in. But Witten claims the geology of Protoceratops sites are well documented, and those very documents made no record of gold being near the skeletal remains of the Protoceratops. Witten goes much more in depth with all of these reasons and claims, I'm just summarizing them for the sake of brevity. So if you want to read the whole post, I'll be sure to leave a link in the description down below for you guys to check it out. But that's the story of the dinosaur who was thought to be a griffin. Hey guys, as always, if you made it to this point of the video, thank you so much for watching. And uh, there hasn't really been any major changes to the channel that's worth addressing. Uh, aside from the fact that I have, in the last two weeks, I've gained this immense amount of new subscribers due to the insane turnout of the last video. So I just want to thank you all uh, for taking time out of your day to watch that video and subscribe to the channel. It really means a lot. Um, and I am going to try my hardest to put out more content like that because that's the kind of content that I'm striving for this year. And uh, I think I did a really good job with this one. This one was really fun to edit, uh, although the research process was absolutely tedious at times. But I did my best with what I could find on the internet, and uh, hopefully, hopefully I didn't get too much wrong, and even if I did, oh well, I'm only human. But um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that just because seeing those kind of numbers on the channel, it just makes me always excited and grateful that, uh, you know, my videos are getting that kind of recognition, and it, it always feels good, you know? Know, even though numbers aren't everything it just it's nice to see you know so thank you guys so much for that so hopefully after this I can finally get to working on the bigger projects that I have planned for the channel hopefully those don't take forever but uh, I, w I do want to do those right so it may take some time but uh, thank you guys for all of the support that you've shown and thank you guys so much for watching this video that's all I have to say for now thank you guys so much for watching and please have a nice day